Every time I try and hide this little bar, every time I fail. All right, well, uh, we're missing a few people. Let's go ahead and get started, and we'll probably roll in while we're uh, talking. Um, <clears throat> got a number of things to uh, cover tonight. I uh, want to talk a little bit about homework stuff. Uh, uh, a lot of people had some problems with the, uh, particularly the last two questions in the uh, homework. So I'm going to uh, walk through a couple of uh, uh, students' answers and uh, talk about uh, kind of what some good things and bad things and tricky things uh, were in there. Uh, and uh, then we'll talk uh, about uh, JSON and RESTful APIs are our two uh, uh, yeah, kind of uh, content uh, topics tonight. Uh, uh, those are going to be fairly quick discussions, uh, and then most of the rest of the uh, time, I want to uh, walk through uh, uh, some changes I made to the sample application we looked at last week uh, to uh, make it run locally so you can debug it more easily, uh, and then to uh, add a uh, new web page to it, uh, kind of as the start of getting you all to understand how to uh, port your uh, project to uh, 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 web pages uh, into Bluemix uh, in Node.js. Um, all of this, I hope, will take only about uh, a, a, a two, uh, maybe hour and a half or two hours or three hours tonight, uh, with the uh, hope then that the uh, rest of it, we can actually treat it as a working session and you start working your projects, uh, Project 2, into Bluemix while I'm right here to help you with it. Because you're going to hit some things. Uh, I did. Uh, and there are a few tricky parts. So we'll watch me walk through it uh, for a web page and uh, then hopefully have some working time in the uh, class for you guys to try it for yourselves. I'm also going to talk a little bit about EJS, or uh, 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 we talked a little bit about template partials last week just in passing. Uh, we'll talk about it more next week, uh, but this is a way of doing uh, partial HTML pages uh, that you can then populate with uh, server-side variables. So that's kind of the uh, plan for tonight. Let's um, start on the homework side. Uh, hey, how'd that stay in there? Okay. Um, so I asked for four uh, homework problems in here, uh, two of which pretty much everybody who attempted it got, uh, and two of which uh, were running about 30 or 40 percent for a uh, complete answer on. Uh, and so I wanted to uh, walk through, uh, in particular, the last two questions that people were having a uh, lot of problems with. Uh, I think the uh, first one everybody was uh, was getting was all from one uh, table, uh, and people were uh, doing a select query from that table. Uh, so I won't talk about it. Um, um, I'd like to encourage you, if you uh, do want to uh, go through this in more detail, to go back to that join page on uh, a SQL Zoo, uh, and then also to uh, look at some of the count functions uh, that uh, are listed up on SQL Zoo. So the first uh, approach to question four that I wanted to uh, get to look at uh, was uh, a pretty good approach. Uh, I uh, am uh, I gave it full marks. Uh, I. Um, I'm not totally happy with it, uh, and I'll talk in a moment about a couple things that uh, could be improved here, uh, but uh, it did most things right. Uh, so again, uh, the uh, question here uh, is, uh, I should have listed this on the page, uh, is, um, oops. List the top five Victoria developers by accepted answer percentage. And so what this one does uh, is uh, selects top 10, doesn't matter, top five, top 10, I don't care. Um, uh, and looks at user ID, display name, uh, yeah, location, uh, and then uh, from the posts uh, uh, table, uh, count posts as uh, answers, uh, and uh, then average uh, yeah, this casting of the score of the posts uh, um, as a percentage accepted. Now, this is cheating just a little bit uh, in that certainly the score is related to accepted answers, uh, but it's not exactly accepted answers. Uh, but this is uh, again, most of the way there, and the things that are in this answer uh, that I uh, wanted to pick up on uh, is that, yeah, you're absolutely taking an average of uh, the, uh, yeah, the individual scores. Uh, uh, this cast statement here uh, uh, is uh, just a way of saying that uh, take a value uh, and treat it as another type of value. So JavaScript is untyped. Uh, yeah, things can be an integer, they can be a float, they can be an object, it just doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, yeah, things are totally untyped in JavaScript, but uh, a SQL is not. Uh, so uh, SQL takes things uh, strictly as an integer or as a float. Uh, and if you ever need to do conversions between the two, like where you want a floating point average of a bunch of integer values, uh, you'll have to do casts in there to uh, be able to do that. So that's what the cast statement is. Uh, it's just saying take a value of one type uh, and interpret it as a, yeah, another type and then storing that as this uh, percentage accepted. Uh, 
And again, uh, a, a score is going to be pretty close to percentage accepted because uh, higher scored questions are accepted much more frequently than lower sort of scored questions. Uh, so the correlation is certainly the, uh, the right direction. Now, the thing that uh, I really wanted for both uh, question three and question four in here uh, was to realize that it required this inner join. Join and inner join are synonymous in SQL. Uh, yeah, the only time you have to specify the inner or outer is if it's an outer join. So you can either say join or you can say inner join. It's going to do exactly the same thing. Uh, and uh, this is uh, grabbing uh, the uh, user's ID from the user's table uh, and matching that with the owner user ID from the post table. Uh, and so that's the, uh, you know, the real trick here is that you have information you need from posts uh, uh, and you need to tie it to the user that, uh, yeah, that made the post. Uh, so uh, that was a big part in there. Uh, and then just the uh, conditions, the where uh, uh, condition. Uh, and uh, for this particular one, we didn't really need the, uh, the tags uh, piece in there, uh, but uh, it, it, that'll come. Oh, for this, this is number four. We did need the tags. Uh, so the tags in this one is matching to uh, a, a JavaScript, of course. Uh, in number three, you didn't need the tags. Number three and number four were basically identical, except with the exception of the tags. And then how we group them, uh, and uh, yeah, the count here, uh, it wasn't really asking the, uh, yeah, the question, uh, but uh, it's a good thing to make sure that people don't get uh, arbitrarily pushed up if they have one uh, highly rated accepted answer. Uh, so uh, I like seeing that in there. And then order them by that percentage accepted. So that's a, a very creditable answer to uh, question number four in there. Uh, um, it, uh, it moves in the same direction as uh, an absolute uh, proportion accepted, uh, um, but isn't exactly uh, the, uh, the number accepted. What I think of as a, uh, whoops, I guess I need to zoom back out before I can go on to the next one. There we go. What I think of as a uh, bit more elegant approach here uh, is uh, uh, this answer. Uh, and uh, so, um, uh, selecting top 10, and that's why actually it was uh, 10, is because we're on number four, list the top 10 developers by accepted answer percentage on questions with JavaScript as a tag. Um, select top 10, again, uh, user ID, display name, location, that's great. Uh, this is the line where the magic is, uh, is sitting. Uh, this uh, round, uh, yeah, basically just uh, yeah, yeah, taking a round number, uh, and again, we've got the cast uh, that uh, look at things as float, so cast as float. Uh, um, but uh, we actually have uh, a, a more complex structure inside here. Uh, we're uh, we're uh, taking uh, the sum of uh, uh, the case statements uh, where uh, ID from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the one table, uh, the uh, uh, users table, uh, is uh, equal to the accepted answer ID from the posts table. Uh, so this is where we're making that direct tie, uh, is this an accepted answer? Uh, it's not just a correlation with score, which does correlate with accepted answer, but it's directly in there. And then uh, counting one if it is uh, and zero if it's not. Uh, uh, as float and then dividing by the, uh, the count of them all. Uh, so this gives us an actual percentage of uh, accepted answers uh, as drawn off of the, uh, the post table in there. And then it's storing that variable as accepted answer uh, percentage. From here on, everything else is basically the, uh, the same, took a little bit different structure on the joins, uh, but uh, that's okay, just making sure it was of the appropriate uh, uh, post type was the reason for the first join. Uh, but then we join uh, the uh, parent uh, ID, uh, in this case, uh, from uh, uh, the uh, user table, uh, and uh, then the uh, ID from the, uh, the posts uh, table. Uh, again, a location in the where clause, uh, and then uh, the uh, tags uh, matching JavaScript uh, in there was the uh, key one differentiating question three from question four. So I consider that uh, the, uh, the best answer that I got in terms of uh, the uh, code for question four in there. Um, was a tricky problem. Um, I hadn't realized quite uh, until I started getting questions back from folks this week, and I got a fair number of them, uh, that uh, uh, this was uh, uh, significantly tricky, and people fought with that uh, pretty, uh, pretty hard. So congrats to those of you that uh, didn't turn in an answer uh, uh, to it, uh, even if it wasn't entirely correct. Uh, uh, everybody who turned in something did a, uh, a real good shot at, uh, at trying on it. Questions about, uh, about these homework answers? Okay. Cool. Um, again, great job on, uh, on hitting them.
So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, JSON in here, uh, and um, JavaScript object notation uh, is uh, something that uh, is uh, kind of permeates uh, not just JavaScript, but uh, I use it in Python a lot. Uh, I uh, use it in C Sharp a lot. Uh, it really is language independent at this point. Uh, it started as JavaScript, uh, but uh, has then uh, gone out there uh, outwards from that. Uh, uh, and it's really just a lightweight object format uh, that can be stringified. Uh, and so what I mean by stringified is that uh, an object uh, in uh, C++, for instance, is just a memory location uh, that uh, uh, has some structure underneath it, but you can never see that structure. It's invisible. It's in the uh, object declaration. Uh, when you have an object in JavaScript, uh, it can be uh, rendered into a string form very easily. So you can spit it out to a text file and pull it back in from a text file. And this is really useful in a lot of uh, data operations. Uh, it makes it self-describing uh, that all you need is the object to understand what's in the object. So JavaScript has a couple built-in functions to uh, to work with this. Uh, the first is the uh, uh, JSON parse function. So if you have something in a text file and you want to bring it back into an object to be able to use in your JavaScript code directly, uh, you'll just parse it in from that text file or from that stream. Uh, and the second is the reverse, the stringify function, uh, where you can spit things out to uh, a, a string that you want to uh, store or serialize uh, is another uh, word for that uh, into a uh, text file. Uh, um, let's you go back and forth very easily from descriptive uh, to uh, uh, yeah, things that you can actually operate upon. So I'm going to jump back out to the cars example we looked at last week uh, and uh, show you a couple examples of uh, JSON formats. Creep, creep, poke. There we go. Remember this one? Uh, we are uh, yeah, adding cars to here. Uh, and uh, so, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, let's uh, add a uh, Tesla Model 3. And that's going to uh, go ahead and uh, add it to our uh, uh, MySQL database uh, in the, uh, the browser. If we uh, were to uh, open up uh, uh, the uh, developer console here and um, open up that last result set, you can see that this result set uh, has a uh, number of, uh, of items in it. Uh, and uh, so let's just look at the uh, last one here, uh, uh, that uh, Tesla Model 3. Um, so this bracket notation is what you'll always see in Java, uh, object, JavaScript object notation, uh, is you'll see uh, brackets uh, followed by a, a series of identifiers with a uh, identifier, then a colon and the value, and then a common and the next identifier, colon, value. Uh, uh, this is the stringified form of a, uh, a, a, a JSON. Uh, if I were to open this up in the browser, I'd see the non-stringified form, uh, uh, where I uh, see uh, that I've got an ID, a make, a model, uh, and then I've got the actual object pieces that uh, allow it to be treated as a JavaScript object. No, I don't care about anything that's in there. Uh, that's just kind of standard uh, a, a JavaScript constructors and, and things like that. Uh, uh, so the stringified form in this case is just as good from my understanding what's actually in that object. Uh, but crucially, from a uh, programmatic standpoint, uh, the fact that it exists in the non-stringified form is what lets me uh, yeah, yeah, operate on it directly within the object. So what I mean by that, uh, and let's actually um, add a bit to the code here to uh, play with uh, yeah, with that. Uh, remember, uh, I uh, let's see where should I do this? Let me do this on uh, delete cars. I think. Uh, yeah, there we go. So as I'm deleting a uh, car in here, uh, let me uh, go ahead and uh, print out uh, an object. And what object do I actually have? Uh, well, actually, let's just see what's in the uh, Mighty B object. Uh, um, that's going to be larger than I uh, want, uh, but uh, run that puppy and then when I delete my Tesla 3 I should have the database uh, spit out and I do okay so over here uh, this database version 1.0 uh, I can open that up uh, oh I guess that's all my uh, database has except for interfaces and that's a pretty boring uh, 
object. Uh, it's actually got all of these other interfaces on it, uh, but none of those are objects uh, that I actually have a string representation for because I can only programmatically call those objects. Uh, so actually, that was probably the wrong thing to uh, spit out in there. Um, <coughs> let's see what other objects I have in here. Mm. Well, not much that's accessible to me. Uh, uh, remembering uh, variable scoping, only things that are declared at the uh, outside scope are uh, things that I can see from in here. Uh, things that are declared in somebody else's function, I don't actually have uh, visibility to. Uh, so uh, I guess let's uh, declare one here. So if I wanted to uh, create a uh, a new object. Uh, let's do this before. Uh, let's create uh, create a uh, variable foo, uh, and uh, then uh, we'll uh, just uh, well let's let's start by uh, yeah, making this a list of uh, variables so you can see a simple uh, a, a variable out of there. We've done that before, and then we'll see how a, uh, a an object differs from uh, a, a, from that that we can serialize a JSON object that we can serialize differs. So uh, let's run with foo. Let's delete another car. I'm going to run out of cars pretty soon. Um, so great. Uh, you can see that even a, uh, an array of uh, values in here is actually uh, a uh, JSON object. Uh, you can see that same pattern that I had just a minute ago of uh, uh, the identifier and then the value. So zero colon and a number, one colon and a number, two colon and a number. Uh, if I were to uh, declare that a little bit differently, I could uh, make that look uh, more familiar uh, as a JSON object, though. Let's uh, declare this and uh, give, uh, yeah, let me get rid of those. Um, uh, let's see, uh, let's say ID and uh, then uh, I want to make sure I actually have my uh, notation correct. Uh, I may not have. Um, I do. Okay, great. So ID foo. Um, you can see that my uh, name is getting double quotes and my contents treated as a string are getting single quotes. And that was the piece that uh, I wanted to uh, make, uh, make sure of in here. Uh, I'm going to run out of cars soon, but it is working okay. Um, so what I mean by it being an actual object in here is that uh, if I wanted to uh, refer to a specific uh, part of that, uh, and uh, let's say console log uh, foo dot name, then I can do that. Uh, I'm going to delete my last card to prove to you that I can do that. So I print my object out again, and uh, then I print foo.name out again, and I have that Derek there. Uh, and so uh, yeah, the only way that it can do that is because it actually has the programmatic interfaces on that job, uh, object still available as the object. It's not just a uh, piece of string, uh, uh, a, a stringified version of the object. Um, but uh, you see that I'm building up the uh, JSON object uh, manually. Uh, I'm printing the whole object out. Uh, and then I'm still able to access the individual members of that object. Uh, and of course, this could be a much more complicated object. And I could still get at it that, uh, yeah, that same way. So that's kind of the, uh, the easiest way of looking at uh, JSON or JavaScript object uh, uh, notation in here. Uh, and uh, how I can uh, get it uh, out into a uh, different form. Now, actually, let me. Uh, uh, do one more thing. I'll add a uh, car back here again, uh, so I have something to delete next time. Uh, and uh, then uh, let me uh, try to console dot log stringify, and I think actually this is JSON dot stringify. See how that changes the world. Run that, and I'm going to delete my Honda Accord. And there we go. You can see that basically this is giving me the same form uh, as uh, I uh, had with the uh, stringified view uh, that I could open up as the object. Uh, 
Um, but that still shows me the full object. Uh, Stringify just sends me the text. I can no longer open that up. The actual underlying object was not there in the uh, Stringified form. So Stringify is how I was sending it out. If I was pulling it in from a file, I'd use parse, of course, to bring it back in as an object. But do you understand what I mean by objects and parse and Stringify? Okay. So Cloudin's basically a JSON store. Uh, this is the reason for all the focus on JSON in here is that uh, as you start working on the database for your project too, uh, you're going to find yourself uh, uh, putting a lot of things up into your database uh, and essentially what you're putting up into your database uh, are just objects from your application. Uh, and anything you can express in JSON, uh, you can throw up in Cloudin. Uh, uh, everything that's in Cloudin uh, can be expressed in JSON. So we'll look at that uh, here next. Um, and looking at that, uh, we're going to uh, go back to the uh, example uh, that I had uh, last week. Uh, well, that's not it. I've got a number of things up here. Huh. Maybe I didn't leave it up. No? Okay, I didn't. Um, so this was at uh, simpletest.mybluemix.net. This was the application that we built as our uh, sample application. Uh, I've added a couple more pictures to it just so we can have something in the database. Uh, um, but uh, this is the one, if you'll recall, uh, where uh, we can uh, uh, pull files and pictures uh, up in here uh, and uh, then uh, have them uploaded. I don't know what this is I'm uploading. It seems large. Um, no, no, it's not that large. Okay, here we go. Um, and uh, so that's the, uh, uh, the, the main thing that uh, we're uh, looking at in here. If we look up at the uh, console itself, um, we'll see that we've got this application uh, sitting here. Uh, hey, wait a minute. That's not where I meant to go. There we go. So we've got the application uh, sitting up here. Uh, but we also have the uh, database. Uh, we'll look at a couple of things in the application itself in just a few minutes here. Uh, but for right now, I want to jump through and look at the database directly. So when I look at the database, it's really just describing Cloudant to me. Yeah, there's nothing I can do from here other than uh, perhaps grab service credentials. Uh, but the launch button here launches a, an application that allows me to edit and uh, manipulate that database directly to see what's in there. So if we uh, launch the uh, database view, We'll be able to, uh, when it comes up, uh, see that uh, we've got the uh, my sample DB that was created. Uh, it's about 57 megs of uh, uh, stuff in there, mostly taken up by those uh, images because it's actually serializing the images into the uh, database as well. And when I uh, look into that database, uh, I can see that I've got, uh, well, I can query it and stuff if I want to, uh, but uh, I can see that I've got uh, one big table of all of my uh, uh, a stringified uh, a JavaScript object. So, so uh, I've got uh, this uh, sample doc, uh, a, a sample document. I uh, named these as I was creating it in the code in app.js. Uh, and then I've got an attachment for each one of the images that are in there. Uh, and this attachment says that it's a JPEG, uh, gives it a uh, position on the uh, screen, uh, and uh, then gives it a uh, name that it can be referred to by. Uh, and um, that is basically corresponding uh, to uh, what these guys are uh, are pulling up. So I can look at any of those attachments as well. Uh, my nice mushrooms. Um, but it's just uh, a, a JSON in here. Uh, each of these individual uh, uh, pieces, you can see that uh, I've got uh, my image uh, that's got a, a JSON object underneath that with content type, ref, pose, digest, length, and a stub. Uh, um, that uh, this is a uh, compound JSON object uh, uh, because right at the top, uh, uh, here's where the JSON object starts. Uh, I've got a, a number of things that uh, refer to the entire database. Uh, and uh, then I've got uh, an attachments object. And underneath the attachment object, I've got a bunch of indi individual uh, attachments. And so the same way as we were looking at uh, uh, files and folders in a directory structure, uh, JSON objects are nested. Uh, uh, you can have objects within objects within objects within objects uh, at infinitum. Uh, and uh, as long as you keep your syntax proper, uh, where you've got uh, your uh, objects described uh, with a name and then a uh, value, uh, that value can be an object in its own right, uh, and they'll disappear hierarchically in here. 
Um, if I wanted to, by the way, yeah, of course, I could uh, change uh, any of these. Uh, um, I don't know that there are good changes to make to actually show up in the uh, document. I'm more likely to break something than I am to actually uh, fix something. Um, but here, let's see if uh, we can uh, rename my fancy mushroom. That's 161620. Let's see if we can rename that to uh, fancy mushroom. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought, because the attachment itself is no longer named that, then that's going to break it. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, I won't uh, try things that I didn't test out before class. <laughs> uh, questions about uh, the, uh, the browser, looking at your database uh, in your console. Uh, uh, this is an easier way of verifying that what you're putting into your database is actually what you think you're putting in the database uh, as soon as you start actually manipulating it uh, and creating code to uh, talk to your database. Um, you're going to need some way of uh, making sure that you're talking to it properly. Uh, you can also query it from here to uh, test out your queries. Uh, um, and that's a way of making sure that when you're pulling data out to display on your web page, uh, you're doing so in such a way that makes sense from the database perspective. So the next thing I want to do is look at the uh, corresponding pieces of code in app.js. We started to look through app.js last week as we were looking at this uh, application, uh, but uh, didn't go very deep into it. Uh, and so this week I wanted to uh, do a, a couple things to dig deeper into how it's actually working. Uh, uh, yeah, so we can understand the relationship between uh, your Node.js application uh, and the database. I'm going to pop out to uh, app.js here. Um, no, I didn't want to parse. That was the next uh, discussion we we're going to have. Um, uh, so again, the way that app.js is uh, structured, uh, and uh, let me look at a few things in here just to, uh, to kind of remind you. Uh, We've got all of the require statements, which are just pulling in different modules that I use within uh, app.js. Uh, and uh, so uh, when I see something referring to uh, uh, FS, that's referring to the file system, Express is our web browser, uh, Roots uh, is uh, the, uh, uh, the Roots directory uh, up here in our uh, application directory. Uh, um, uh, HTTP and Path are both libraries that are being used in here. Uh, um, and also, uh, and this is down here a ways, and I think this is actually uh, probably not the, uh, the most readable place to put it, uh, but uh, I've got uh, a, um, where's my Cloudant uh, piece? For our Cloudant, well, I had it found a minute ago. There we go. Uh, Cloudant equals require Cloudant uh, with the uh, DB credentials uh, URL. Um, the reason they've declared it all the way down here, which is actually fairly bad programming practice to uh, have your uh, pulling in modules happen deeper in the file, uh, is that they needed to pass it credentials and able to uh, make it initialized properly. Uh, so even your Cloudant calls are actually taking place by means of a, uh, a pulled in module uh, that uh, is then referenced from the, uh, the JSON code. We'll walk over uh, the uh, DB connection uh, stuff here in just a minute because uh, there's uh, something that uh, we've got to do to make sure that the uh, uh, credentials are being passed in appropriately in the local case. So we'll come back and look at that later. Um, but beyond that, uh, we have all of these app uh, get and app put and app get post and app delete statements. Uh, Remember uh, that in a CRUD application, we talked about this two weeks ago, uh, you've basically got uh, the uh, 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 create, uh, you've got update, uh, you've got delete, uh, um, uh, you've got replace. Uh, and these four operations are your basic ways of uh, talking to your database. Uh, well, the same consists of uh, uh, talking to a web page, that a web page has a uh, HTTP get, HTTP put, uh, HTTP uh, uh, delete, and HTTP post. Uh, 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 and uh, these are uh, rough correspondences to a CRUD app, and uh, they're actually uh, directly corresponding to what we'll describe later in today's lecture as a RESTful app. Uh, and uh, so uh, think about uh, yeah, the difference as you're uh, looking through app.js uh, and what forms a uh, GET request and what forms a uh, PUT request specifically. Yeah. Uh, most of these are POST. Uh, most of these are GETs. Um, 
but we hit our first post when we're putting an attachment onto uh, the, uh, the page. Now we could very well attach with a GET request. From the web server's uh, perspective, uh, it doesn't actually care that much. Uh, it's just a request that's coming in. Uh, but in order to keep this a properly structured app, uh, we have a uh, difference between POST and, uh, and GET in here. Again, we'll talk about that when we talk about RESTful applications. Um, but I was coming on down here, uh, yeah, this is to talk about Stringify uh, and um, looking for the place in here where we don't update, but we um, create, uh, here, here it is. Uh, so when I call the uh, root uh, uh, my application slash API slash favorites, uh, um, uh, yeah, then I am actually uh, creating the database uh, or, or using the database and uh, getting a list of things in the database uh, uh, if it isn't created yet. Uh, but if the length of this uh, uh, database as defined by var length equals body dot rows dot length, uh, i.e. I'm parsing the body of this request, uh, um, is equal to zero, if len equal equal to zero, then I know I do not have a database yet, uh, and I need to actually create that database. So I'm going to give it a name. This is where that sample doc came from, and a description, a sample document. Uh, and then I'm going to insert them into the, uh, uh, the database. Now, if all goes well, uh, then I've just created a database. If all does not go well, uh, then I have a situation where I have to log an error and understand what's actually happened here. Uh, and that's where uh, I uh, wanted to show the example of uh, Stringify, uh, that uh, in logging that error, I've got a bunch of values for uh, objects that are uh, supposed to be used in here, uh, that uh, the contents of which might actually, actually tell me what went on and what caused that error. And so when I spit out using a console log, remember the console log is something that just spits out to your uh, text console, uh, I, I want it to send a stringed version over a stringified version of the objects that are failing so that I can try and debug what happened in there. So that's where we're using this JSON stringify. Anything that is an object in JavaScript, I can uh, say JSON stringify, uh, I put that object in brackets and I'll turn you a string version of that that I can do, for instance, spitting out on a console log or anywhere else I want a debug message. On the other side, we've got an example of parse in uh, app.js as well. Let's come back up and find that. Oh, that was another string file. There it was. So right at the start with git db credentials, um, I'll go through this in a uh, little bit more uh, detail in a few minutes, uh, but one of the hard parts of setting this up to uh, run locally on your machine is that your database is up in the cloud somewhere, uh, and it doesn't know who's actually trying to connect to it, uh, and it'll only be able to accept connections from authorized locations. Uh, uh, this is part of why we have a server here at all, is that we don't want your clients in the browser having access to all your database credentials, so it must run from your server that only you control. But in order to uh, give it those credentials, uh, if I'm running up on Bluemix itself, uh, then it has those credentials implicitly. Uh, there's this uh, object on Bluemix called VCAP services uh, um, that everything that's running within your user account on Bluemix keeps all of your credentials in one place uh, and talks to all the other services in a way that can use those credentials. But if I'm running on my local machine, I don't have that. Uh, I'm running stuff here and, and treating this as a server uh, and wanting to talk to my Bluemix server that doesn't know this machine uh, from, uh, from Adam. Uh, and so uh, I have to have a file that contains my uh, login credentials to the database. And that file is really just a uh, stringified version of a, uh, a, a JSON object. So let's look at um, that file for a moment this vcap local.json. And I can see that uh, it uh, is saying this is a cloud database. Um, I've got a set of credentials. Here's a username, a password. Uh, uh, here's where it's running the host. Here's the port that it's on. Uh, here's the URL, uh, which you can see is basically just a uh, modification of that uh, host name. Uh, and then a bunch of things about it. Uh, I don't have any volumes mounted. Uh, I don't have a, uh, a log URL set up. Uh, uh, label is just the same thing as the name. Uh, I don't have a provider. I'm on the light plan, meaning that it's the free plan that I uh, can't put too much on. It's not the uh, one that's a big uh, database. Uh, 
and then here's the application that it belongs to, uh, and then a few tags uh, along with it. So this whole structure of data is the stuff that uh, uh, Bluemis is, is expecting uh, in order to uh, authenticate a user of the database. Uh, and the reason that uh, I'm able to have it stringified in a file here is that uh, my Cloudant object that I'm using from within app.js knows how to pick this up, uh, send it to Bluemix, uh, and then remain authenticated through the remainder of that uh, JavaScript program. Um, again, though, we'll talk about that bit uh, in a, a few minutes, and right now I really just want to have the uh, idea of uh, this being a textual representation of an object that is being parsed into app.js using this JSON parse and grabbing the JSON data, which is the VCAP services file. Uh, one more degree of indirection in there, of course. Uh, the uh, JSON data that's, uh, that's being grabbed uh, is uh, actually uh, coming from, uh, oh, where's the actual bit? Oh, there we go. So it's coming in through the uh, environment variable VCAP services. Uh, and uh, it's uh, only if it's not finding that environment variable uh, that it's uh, grabbing uh, the uh, get credentials by URL, uh, grab uh, VCAP local.json and pull that in from the file system. And then that's what's being uh, turned into the JSON data that's being parsed uh, to uh, actually uh, produce the uh, object that's being used uh, to uh, do authentication with. Um, so that's about where I'm going to leave uh, JSON. Uh, I uh, hit a few other things surrounding JSON with that uh, that uh, uh, may have been a bit confusing. We'll cover those a little bit more later. Uh, we're going to talk more about the uh, authentication side of things, about that VCAP uh, uh, yeah, local file. Uh, uh, we're going to talk a little bit uh, yeah, more about the uh, Cloudant uh, data here in a, uh, a bit. Uh, but uh, just on the JSON side of things, the idea that uh, you've got a JavaScript object, uh, that object can be stringified with JSON stringify uh, into a text file. It can come back from a text file with JSON parse uh, and be used as an object again. Are those concepts clear with folks? Kind of? Fuzzy? A little bit? Okay. We'll use them in an exercise here in a minute. That ought to make, uh, make things clear. I don't know what the exercise is yet, but we may use them in an exercise. So the next thing I want to talk about is REST APIs. Um, this is uh, really just a term you'll come across, uh, and uh, uh, don't worry too much about the, uh, the details here at this point, uh, but uh, it has the idea that uh, when uh, you uh, talk to a web server, uh, you're uh, uh, doing so uh, in a way that's uh, largely stateless, uh, that you're uh, talking to a particular URL or endpoint, uh, and you're getting a, an answer or a response from that, uh, and then your application is what's responsible for keeping the state between the calls. Uh, and uh, it, it, you want to uh, use a, an appropriate way of talking to the web server uh, to uh, correspond with this uh, REST architectural style. REST stands for representation, uh, Representational State Transfer, uh, and says that uh, you should uh, use HTTP as a way of uh, implementing this uh, by using GET requests, Post, uh, post requests, put requests, and delete requests to, uh, for mutation, deletion, creation. Uh, and um, part of that is never ever use get requests for updating information. That get request should have this uh, feature called indemnipotency. Uh, it, I hate that word. Indemnipotency, which means that if you call it twice, it doesn't change things. If I were using it for update, for instance, if I used a GET request to attach a file to my database uh, and I called it twice, that file would be attached twice. Uh, but uh, GET request should never have side effects is basically what that means. Uh, so any GET request of my web server, I can call any number of times and always just get what was asked for and not have a side effect of doing something permanent on the web server. So GET is kind of in this special state that it always just gets. It doesn't have side effects and do other things with it. Uh, a put or a post or a delete, all those things have uh, effects on the server uh, that can't be reversed, essentially. Uh, if you change something that's up there or delete something that's up there, uh, uh, you can't uh, then in the next request have that, uh, have that undo, uh, unless you have another uh, way of undoing that. Uh, um, but uh, the REST server itself or the RESTful uh, API itself won't guarantee that you can call any of the things other than get repeatedly without other effects. 
Um, there's a good stack overflow uh, question here uh, that uh, I grabbed some of these definitions from and uh, that uh, uh, if you are confused about REST applications, uh, feel free and hop up there and, and look at that. I really just want to introduce the uh, terminology though uh, as a uh, way of talking about the Cloudant API because the Cloudant uh, API is a uh, RESTful API. Uh, the only thing that prevents you from being able to use it uh, just as a browser URL is the fact that you have to authenticate with it. So I'd originally put together a uh, bit of a um, uh, exercise to uh, look at the Cloudant API uh, using a, um, uh, a tool called Postman. Postman uh, is uh, essentially just a URL browser uh, that uh, you can attach authentication credentials to. And uh, <coughs> I found it really useful for uh, uh, yeah, testing APIs from services like this. So I decided it was kind of tangential to what we actually needed to do today, though, and so I cut the Postman discussion. If you are, though, interested in looking at some of this stuff directly, Postman is something to remember and uh, ask me if you have questions about it. Um, I do, though, want to uh, I don't know why it didn't actually copy, but uh, want to look at this uh, integrating apps. Uh, no, no, no. Maybe I didn't save it. No, I guess I didn't save it. Um, and this isn't going to let me copy out of it. Well, maybe I didn't want to look at uh, integrating uh, RESTful apps uh, and services uh, that badly then. Um, uh, in any case, uh, the, uh, the URL that is in here in the slides actually has a uh, fairly decent description uh, of uh, uh, yeah, RESTful apps itself uh, and talking about why Cloudant is a good example of a, uh, a RESTful API. Uh, and uh, it, it then also talks about the ability to uh, use tools like Postman to integrate with other uh, applications that also have RESTful APIs. I'll leave that at that for right now. Um, the main thing that I wanted to uh, go through uh, tonight uh, is uh, uh, Node.js setup. So you all have Node.js setup locally, and I'm shifting gears a little bit uh, here, actually. Before I shift gears, i got to give people a chance to ask questions about RESTful APIs. Have uh, I uh, said anything you want more detail on? Okay, shifting gears. Um, so you all have uh, installed uh, uh, Node.js. Uh, I think it was uh, three weeks ago, maybe, uh, um, maybe even four weeks ago, uh, you uh, uh, you installed NPM and Node.js, and you looked at the version of each of those to make sure that they were installed. Uh, and then we really didn't do all that much with them. Uh, tonight, we're going to go in more depth and, uh, and do more with them. And so uh, I want to start with uh, the uh, simplest version of a uh, Node.js install, uh, which is actually the uh, tutorial from uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, and um, I think I'd like, actually, to have you guys uh, just uh, walk through that tutorial. Uh, and uh, this will do a, a few things. Uh, this will uh, make sure that uh, your uh, Visual Studio Code is set up properly. Uh, it'll make sure that Node.js and NPM are set up properly. Uh, and it'll make sure that you understand uh, basically how to uh, start the uh, simplest version of a uh, Node.js application and run it uh, uh, inside your local browser. And so after that, after you're uh, done with those things, uh, then we can go on uh, and uh, uh, yeah, look at uh, the Express tutorial, uh, and then we'll download the same sample that we looked at last week and make it uh, run locally. So why don't we take about 10 minutes or so uh, and uh, have you guys walk through uh, this uh, tutorial uh, yourselves on your machines. And chat if you have problems.
Um, so it ran anyway. So uh, if we're in the if we're in the second. Okay. Do a uh, cap of uh, cap. Of Yeah, so uh, I think you're uh, you're uh, not fully uh, uh, running. Yeah. So uh, it was, So I would actually, yeah, how do you open this file? Is that file open? Yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha. So uh, actually, in your, uh, in one of the programs, and in your, uh, you can get back. Yeah, so you can get I'm sorry, you mean hello? Uh, well, in every single application, you need to uh, install it. In fact, in this one specific, uh, you need to install it. Not 
Did it even make the right process? No. the same. Huh. So yeah, that is what I was expecting that to look like. The question is, why doesn't it? Um, do a couple things for me. Uh, do a uh, node minus V and uh, tell me what version of node you have uh, and uh, then an NPM minus minus version. Is it? Shoot, that makes things more complicated. Um, uh, how about an NPM minus V express generator? No, that's not going to do anything different for you. Never mind. Ah, there we go. NPM minus uh, NPM list minus G express generator. Derek App Chain and open the NPM Express Generator. You get when you get when you say NPM Swiss list and that's the Express Generator. So try and just that same command for me again. Uh, and, and maybe make a scratch to it. So that uh, is that uh, uh, yeah. is Yeah.
Now, let's see how far this goes. And navigate to that direction. Oh, that is not. You've got the seed drive with the seed rex. Then user is writing to that data. Uh, let's go back to that in here. Um, but uh, but that's the cross stuff. And let me do a bit of Google too and try and figure out an answer to that. And you hit the same Google too, which I have all the steps from this. What we're looking for is something along the lines of uh, an Indian Google directory that happens. Um, and hopefully something pops up on a Christmas tree. Okay. Hey, what's that? Saying that express to uh, <coughs> not be able to count that that is so on. So um, you are uh, what's it supposed to be Yeah, and I'll continue serving that support for you guys until you get control C because I think that can happen with our guys.
first grade, uh, it did that actually have not happened. It's, uh, it's saying that uh, it would be a good one. Will you do that uh, npm config ls minus l command and let's page through that on yours. I'm going to spend just a minute uh, trying to understand when it's said in mine. Config ls minus l, it's on the uh, very left hand side of this page that's up right here. Yeah, okay, that's good. What we're looking for is stuff in that really big list of stuff that looks really wrong. So let me come up over your shoulder and let's see if we can find something that looks really wrong. I would uninstall. Well, actually, let's go back and install on this. Let's pull back up to the secret. Mm-hmm. 
um, let's just try getting rid of this rush generator and the installed So, uh, uh, if anything, if you can uninstall, so I can install it. So this is either a um, I want to find a different global uh, install uh, that, that can see that the same problem. So I'm not going to buy this is a fresh generator problem or a global problem. So find something that gives a more than global Uh, your node installs do that sometimes. When you say a node minus V equals a present. Okay. Um, so you got the right version from there, but what it's saying is that uh, it's not able to uh, write to your uh, node via uh, the and I don't know why this is the case. Um, screwing that thing, perhaps, but uh, I just like screwing that thing from Did you install this as uh, a, a root or as administrator? When, when you installed Node originally, uh, how'd you do it? Okay. Would you uninstall node and then go through the uh, install steps at that uh, directory? OK, 
Because I don't think my slides had to go through homebrew. Did it? You don't remember. Okay. Uh, so, so for you, you're actually on a PC. That's a different issue that we've got for you. Um, Tyler is crazy magic too. So yours is uh, crazy magic. Now, I might still have you uninstall or reinstall node, uh, but that's going to be a uh, different, uh, different, 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 different. Um, we might be at you didn't find a good time to get their own solve, uh, Yeah, no, I was, uh, uh, that's probably kind of a silly way of, uh, of doing that anyway. So, um, I think this is an NPM issue, uh, rather than a no issue, that it is going to be a global site directly in the express generator. Um, let's 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 try to install and installing that on your printer as well. It might be a reasonable thing to do. Um, just to from that at least for the Well, that's all. Who's uh, else do it? Where, who has absolutely done the uh, whole thing? Hands, lots of hands. Okay. Yeah, <coughs> um, yeah I do with you if you're a heavy, right? Uh, heavy, but, uh, but I think we've got about half a hand, so I'm going to go on and have that few minutes here. Um, I want to give uh, Ryan a chance to get uh, slightly different so we can uh, solve uh, Skyward for one of us. Um, if you all are uh, done sitting here, uh, um, uh, you know, what I've been for the last half of class here is that, uh, uh, and we're going to be, this is going to be not quite the last half of class, but the last hour or so, is uh, working on uh, the exercise to get your project to port it up into uh, BlueNet. So, and you've got most of what you need to do that now. But, um, they, uh, basically, uh, we're going to go through my example here uh, in the, uh, the next step. So, but uh, uh, make sure you're able to uh, um, get up on Bluenex, modify the app.js from the uh, Bluenex application. And if you want to skip ahead in my slides, uh, I'm on the uh, slideshow.net, uh, uh, you should be able to go to try and modify the get uh, pages up there. Um, but if you just want to replace the uh, index.html with your base HTML page, uh, from your project to uh, the next bit. If that does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, sure, give that, give that uh, a shot. Uh, no. So this isn't going to be number. Uh, okay. The page didn't uh, that that group work. Oh and on you went back to my old slides to the uh, yeah. number of work. Yeah, let's let's try it this way. So, so you uninstalled it from three years? Yeah, I think I installed it. Just the minute on the. Yeah. Uh, this is a different version, though. 
time. So actually, go ahead and try a little gate through this time, because uh, I don't know any reason why that would be. See if this uh, it still works. Uh, so you had done uh, an npm install minus p um, express. Uh, yeah, I and that was the line that they offered. Well, damn it. Um, we are uh, kind of moved from a weird permission issue. And I think I might suggest that you follow those instructions there to uninstall it again and call the homebrew setup. Because it's all reason for doing the homebrew setup is get rid of around here. Um, the other way we could try to forge into that uh, is try to get sudo to that command. Uh, so uh, a, a, a sudo uh, is to up one out. You know, So you will uh, run into that every time you're installing a global package. Um, you'll probably not install another global package. So you might be okay. Uh, if you follow the rest of the steps from there, see if it works and if it does, you will commit to our victory uh, and just tell you to Uh, sorry, I don't care what we're talking about. I'm still trying to do that, figure out people on the stall phones. Uh, uh, if you're stuck on the tutorial, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, it's not that no, <coughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, your version is all updated. That's all fine. Um, how in the hell is that so stupid? I can close this. Uh, um, this window I'm always talking about.
let's decide screw it for the moment. Um, I, I, I don't know how to get you to the end of that tutorial, but uh, in fact, this is the last time we'll be using the generator for uh, Express. From here on out, we'll use one that's already generated. And so if that's the only problem you hit, uh, well, I guess we don't care that much. Um, but I'm a little bit stumped by it, honestly. Okay. I and, and you got roughly the uh, that all worked after that. Yeah, I worked on it after that. Okay, cool. Excellent. Um, so I think we're probably ready to forward ahead. It looks like you were already working with website stuff, so if we move on to the website stuff and get that one here. Okay, cool. So I'm going to talk through a number of things that I had to uh, do to uh, get the uh, application to run locally on my machine so that I could debug it properly. Yeah. And the first was this uh, a, a vcap local.json that I uh, noticed there that I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, uh, but I want to talk a little bit more about. Uh, now this is a, a set of security credentials, uh, and uh, there are processes uh, that uh, sweep GitHub uh, on a regular basis for all public GitHub repositories. Uh, to see if there are security credentials logged in there so they can steal them and use that uh, your credential to do nefarious things on your uh, pages. Uh, you guys don't so much care about Bluemix because we're on trial versions uh, and it can't uh, 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 do anything that will hit your credit card or anything like that anyways. Uh, but uh, if you ever put an Amazon Web Services uh, credential up on uh, GitHub, uh, it'll get scooped within the hour uh, and uh, rack up thousands of dollars of charges from Amazon on your account. Uh, so uh, just really get in the habit of never checking credentials uh, into uh, GitHub. Never put a file up there that has your password in it or your uh, web server credentials. Uh, and the way you do that is by uh, creating this git ignore file. Uh, um, but uh, first we have to actually create this uh, a, a vcap local.json file so that uh, it's able to understand uh, what your credentials are when you're running things locally. So let's look at uh, where, I, uh, where I found those. And I actually went through a, a number of false starts to try and find these. I'm going to uh, clear a bit of the stuff out uh, here. Uh, okay, a lot of the stuff out here. Don't need that one anymore. I've already been there. Um, we'll come back to that, so I'll leave it open. We're done with that. We don't need anything there. I know my own slides. Oh, we'll be back to that one. Okay, so I first uh, I went through and found uh, a, uh, a getting started tutorial for the SDK for Node.js that told me that uh, should be using a structure kind of like this, services, cloud, NoSQL DB, credentials, URL. Uh, and I just needed to give it the URL. Uh, this totally didn't work. Um, I, uh, this was a uh, false path. Uh, I also uh, figured that uh, if I just looked at the uh, uh, NoSQL DB and grabbed the uh, credentials, uh, uh, that this would work. Uh, uh, sadly, that didn't work either. Uh, the service credentials for the uh, database were not what it was looking for. Uh, what it was looking for uh, is something that uh, is the uh, exact match to the uh, VCAP services environment variable. Uh, and so the way that I uh, found this was uh, uh, when I came into my console and I selected my, uh, my simple test application. And in here, I looked at, where the hell was it? Was it runtime environment variables? And this VCAP services is the uh, format that I needed to actually uh, connect to my uh, cloud and uh, DB from here. So I copied VCAP services, and then I uh, went into uh, my Google code window and created this file, VCAP local.json and just pasted that in there. So that's the first thing you're gonna to have to do uh, is to go up to your console.ng.bluemix.net, uh, go into your running application you've already pushed up to the web server, uh, uh, you go to running variables, environment variables, VCAP services, and copy everything that's in there. 
and copy that to a file that is vcap-local.json. And that's going to uh, enable uh, the uh, app.js uh, when you're running locally to grab the same credentials to talk to your database in the same way as it would have if you were running on the uh, Bluemix server. The next thing in here is uh, editing that git ignore. And uh, in editing git ignore, I'm going to do a couple things in there. Uh, the uh, first is I'm going to uh, absolutely put that vcap-local.json file in there because that holds my credentials. Uh, and anything you put in the .git ignore file uh, is simply going to be ignored by git. So it's not going to check it in. It's not going to push it up. It's not even going to recognize that it's there when you say git.status uh, or git status rather. Um, the other thing I'm going to put in there, though, uh, is the uh, node underscore modules directory. So when you do an npm install, uh, it's creating a subdirectory uh, that uh, uh, has uh, all of um, – here, let's go into uh, Bluemix uh, and simple test and do an ls. Um, you know, see, I've got this node modules directory uh, that uh, if I uh, go into that, uh, I've got just a bazillion different things in here. Uh, um, so if I actually include the node modules directory in my GitHub, uh, every time I uh, sync GitHub or pull GitHub down, I'm going to have uh, many, many megs of data coming down that I really don't need to have come down. Uh, um, these aren't things I've written. They're just things that I'm depending on inside the packages that I use in this application. And so I don't want those going up to GitHub. Uh, and so I include node underscore modules in the uh, .git ignore as well. And that means that the onus is on me every time I pull my package down to a new directory from GitHub, every time I put it on a new machine, to remember to say npm install. And that will bring down all my node modules directory from the npm repository rather than from GitHub. This also is the advantage of getting me the latest version of all those uh, packages when I do an npm install. Um, I put a couple other things into my uh, 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 .git ignore. Uh, um, nothing terribly important, though. Uh, uh, the main thing being I had a debug log for a bunch of errors that I was getting at one point. I didn't want my debug log necessarily uh, spitting up to uh, GitHub either. So as I uh, have something that's a generated file that I don't really care about saving with my project, I'll generally throw it in the .git ignore uh, just so I don't have to worry about it anymore. So npm install, we talked about that. That brings down all the uh, dependencies uh, and uh, then uh, npm start the, uh, the thing. Um, so let's uh, come into my simple test uh, and uh, uh, do my npm install just to make sure that uh, I've done all that properly. I know that I have because I just looked inside that directory, yeah, but sometimes I'll be surprised and something new will come down. And then I'll uh, do an npm start on the thing. And again, that's just from the root of my uh, project uh, uh, directory in here that I uh, do that uh, npm start. And so you can see that it's uh, looking at the cloud boilerplate node.js uh, uh, call start uh, on app.js, um, and then it says express server listening on port 3000. Uh, uh, could not create new DB, my sample DB, it might already exist. Well, sure enough, we know that it exists because we were just looking at it up on the, yeah, the website, so that's why it couldn't create a new one. Um, what this allows me to do now uh, is uh, that if I pop over uh, to uh, um, that's the one up on Bluemix. I should be able to uh, uh, look on localhost as well. Localhost 3000. And that'll pull me up my same page. Uh, but this is not coming from my Bluemix server. This is now coming from my local machine. Uh, and uh, I can tell that a couple of ways. Uh, the uh, easiest is to look back at uh, uh, that console window. This is the one that I just did the NPM start on. Uh, and you'll see that I have a whole bunch of stuff coming out of my console log, uh, uh, that I got a root uh, a, a directory, uh, that then it went and uh, grabbed the style CSS and the images and the scripts, uh, 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 that there was a git method invoked, uh, and then it started getting all of the images, uh, and all these images are coming down from the, uh, uh, the database, and here are the calls that uh, went ahead and got those images. So I can see all of the individual requests that are coming through app.js uh, expressed in my console log, uh, which previously would have been hidden from me. Uh, um, now, I might have been able to uh, go and uh, browse through um, something up here. I'm kind of curious, actually, if I could have. Uh, memory and instances. No, I might not have been able to even. Uh, oh, logs. Yeah, so I should have been able to come into, uh, no, nope, that's not the log I want. 
No, I don't think there would have been any way for me actually to have gotten my de a detailed debug out book uh, off of uh, Bluemix. Uh, that it's uh, really essential if you want to be able to do uh, console log statements that appear uh, that you can see as you're programming uh, on your server, uh, that you be able to run your server locally and not just on Bluemix. And this is really important stuff because uh, as I go through and modify my server-side code, uh, if something's going wrong and it's on Bluemix, not only do I take uh, uh, three or four minutes to push it up to Bluemix each time I make a little change, uh, um, but if I'm not able to see what went wrong or put a console log statement, I have no real way of debugging up on Bluemix either. So running locally is really important for doing your, uh, your development uh, of your server-side application. Um, I want to make sure that people understand how I got to that point and don't have any burning questions before I uh, walk into the uh, next set of things. Everybody okay with uh, the uh, uh, three steps basically uh, to uh, install this uh, locally? Uh, uh, that being to make sure that Node and NPM are set up, uh, uh, set up the local security file, uh, uh, set up your .git ignore. Um, those are the three things that uh, uh, really need to be done to uh, run, stuff, uh, uh, run stuff locally. Okay. I'm going to go on from there uh, and uh, go into a bit more depth on this sample application uh, and talk about how we put in a uh, second page. Uh, um, so it's fairly easy when you're building uh, a, a, a um, uh, sorry, there we go. Uh, it's fairly easy when you're building an HTML file locally uh, to have multiple pages and have those pages linked to each other. Uh, but when you're building a server-side application, you have to do just a little bit more work in order to uh, get a new page into the application. So to tell you what I uh, show you what I mean by a uh, new page in here, uh, I'm going to uh, just open up a new uh, browser window here to localhost 3000 uh, uh, slash foo. This page I created that basically just says hello, or hello you in this case. I guess I was. Uh, so how did I get that in there? Um, a couple ways uh, that you can uh, remember uh, how I got that in there. The first is uh, please feel free to uh, go up to my uh, GitHub uh, for uh, simple test. Uh, it's just in my uh, a, a profile under simple test, and uh, you can look at the commits that I made. Um, ignore the initial commits. Um, these initial commits were just pulling in the base project that the uh, sample file that I downloaded from Bluemix had for me. Uh, so don't worry about all the changes that are in there. Uh, but uh, uh, you'll notice that I have a commit for adding the uh, .gitignore, and that just puts the three files into my gitignore we talked about a moment ago. Uh, and then I've got a commit for adding a new root. And this adding a new root uh, uh, shows me changing app.js. So I add the root in app.js. Uh, um, it's a git root for slash foo and points to roots.foo. And then uh, in index.js in roots, so roots index.js, I added an export for foo that is just following the same template that we followed for the index uh, a, 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 a export from this uh, a file, where it's calling a, a function with the uh, request and the result and then rendering the result of foo.html. And then finally, uh, I needed foo.html, uh, which is just my little HTML file that has a, an HTML body and a hello uh, and uh, closes those tags. So an absolutely nothing little HTML file, uh, but uh, in order to get that to show up, I had to uh, add something to index.js uh, and add something to app.js uh, in order to have my application know that this was a root that it should serve up. Does that idea of a root and uh, what these files do make sense? Kind of, somewhat, a little bit? Okay, let's add another one just to uh, help uh, clarify that so you can see me actually in the uh, files where we did this. So again, in app.js, um, I've got a whole bunch of stuff in here, but I don't care about most of it right now. Uh, uh, here's where the, uh, uh, the root of the application, uh, the root root, as it were, R-O-O-T, R-O-U-T-E, um, uh, is uh, found. Uh, and so I just use that as a template to create a new one. Uh, and uh, let's create a, uh, another page. Uh, yeah. Uh, 93. Uh, no, 95. Uh, so let's create another one in here, uh, make another uh, git root, uh, and uh, let's call this app bar. Just to complete my foo bar metaphor. And I'll call that roots.bar. Now if I were to uh, run this at uh, this point, uh, 
and then try and navigate to uh, a Roots Bar. Let me stop my server here and restart my server here. Thank you for that. Uh oh, I'm going to get an error. And my error here is saying uh, roots.get requires a callback function, uh, but uh, got nothing. Uh, and so this kind of cryptic error uh, is uh, basically saying that uh, I don't have my uh, root defined, but I act as, as if it was defined. So that means I got to do something else to fix this. Um, I got to go to uh, my roots index.js and export something for uh, uh, exports.bar. And I ought to be able to get rid of that error just by doing that. I don't know that I can, but uh, let me uh, try that. No, okay, that wasn't sufficient. I need to actually give it a definition, not uh, just pretend to give it a definition. I probably can point to the same page though. Yeah, sure enough. I can point to the same page. Uh, so uh, now if I go uh, to uh, localhost 3000 bar, I ought to also get served up that hello you. Um, now that's not really what I wanted. Uh, so uh, let me uh, come in and uh, take my uh, foo.html uh, and uh, I, I copy that and uh, paste that. And I've got a foo one, let's call this bar.html. And in bar.html, uh, I'm just going to say go away. So uh, I also, though, have to, in my roots, modify that because now I want to go to bar.html, not foo.html. And I'll have to stop this and start that again. There we go. And now I ought to be able to refresh bar and have it say go away. So that's the whole process of adding a new uh, page uh, to uh, your uh, Bluemix web server in this uh, boilerplate application. Uh, if you've got to add something to app.js, uh, you've got to add something to roots index.js, and you've got to create the HTML page. Uh, and those three steps mean that you should have everything you need to take your uh, HTML files from project two uh, and plug them into uh, your Bluemix sample application uh, in a way that uh, will uh, be able to at least get to the point where you were when you're showing it on GitHub pages uh, during your Project 2 presentations. Um, now, there are a lot of things we can do to make this simpler, and we'll keep working on that, uh, but that should be uh, kind of your basic uh, uh, your basic bits to get it up there. Questions? Yeah. Uh, it does. So your CSS uh, is, uh, uh, it, there's a couple of things in the uh, structure of the project uh, that, uh, uh, just for your uh, uh, benefit, you should probably try and follow. Uh, if in this views directory uh, you had a uh, CSS file and you were including it uh, the same way you did in your uh, GitHub pages, uh, it would work. It would be just fine. Uh, it would not be uh, structured in a way to allow your CSS to be uh, debugged uh, as easily as it could be, though. Uh, and so uh, if we look at the way that index.html is uh, set up here, uh, it's actually pulling uh, its style sheet in from slash style style.css, uh, which if we look up in here in the uh, public directory, uh, slash style style.css. So you'd be better off putting your CSS uh, pages in that style directory uh, and then referencing them the same way that uh, index.html does a slash style and then whatever the name of your CSS file is. All that clear as mud? Okay, hopefully a little bit clearer than that, but there we go. Um, I want to go through uh, a uh, really quick discussion of uh, uh, EJS templates before we uh, uh, call things off and go uh, start working on getting your own sites up there. Uh, um, this is just because as you port your pages from Project 2 over, uh, um, you're going to have two problems. Uh, the first problem is not going to come up today because you're not loading any data from your uh, uh, Project 2 uh, pages. Uh, um, but as soon as you try and load data in there from the uh, database, uh, 
you're going to find you can't get it in there, that your web page doesn't know how to talk to the server to get that data. And uh, you're going to want to do that from your Node.js uh, server side code. Uh, and so EJS is a way of uh, doing two things. Uh, it's a way of populating server side variables in such a way that uh, your client side web page can pick them up and operate on them. So for instance, if I uh, were uh, creating a puppy mill uh, web page uh, and I wanted my list of puppies to show up, uh, I'd be going to my database on the server side and getting a uh, variable named puppies uh, and then uh, uh, using that variable on the client side uh, to uh, actually iterate through and create a list item for each puppy on the list. You'd have to use uh, something in order to pass those variables across. Now you could serialize it as JSON and pass everything over as JSON and have a more complicated script on the client side that sucked that JSON open uh, and uh, then populated your page with it. But using EJS templates is an easier way of doing that because it gives you a structure to actually use server side variables. The other thing that an EJS template does for you uh, is it allows you to uh, have partials. The idea of a partial really comes into play yeah, when you're talking about things like headers and footers. Let's say that you have four pages in your website, uh, and each of those four pages uh, has the same navigation bar at the top. You don't want to write that navigation bar on each of your four web pages. First of all, it's wasteful. Uh, you're writing your same code four times, once for each page. But secondly, it's a recipe for errors. You're going to end up with one of those pages slipping slightly out of sync of the others. You'll make a change in one place, forget to carry it through to the others. Uh, it's just a bad idea to write code more than once if you can at all get away with it. And so the way to write code only once using EJS is to write that header as a partial and then just include the partial from your other pages so that you're writing the actual HTML only once in there. So partials and server-side variables are the two things that you'll want to uh, look at uh, EJS for. And I don't know that uh, today I necessarily want to walk through the uh, EJS tutorial. I think I'm going to leave you to uh, do that in your own time, uh, but uh, please do have a look at that because next week we're going to be talking more about EJS and how to actually ask your database for data and push them through to your client web page. Um, I think that was uh, uh, the uh, main things I wanted to, uh, uh, to do before going on to uh, some project work. Uh, um, experience has shown, though, that as soon as I say, yeah, great, let's work on projects with me around, uh, some good number of you are going to make like a uh, bullet to the door. Uh, and uh, uh, so I think before we uh, break into project work, uh, and I really would encourage you to work on it while I'm here to help solve problems. If you can get uh, your uh, project two uh, minimally working on Bluemix, you're really far ahead in order to get your project three done uh, and uh, make use of my time here to do that. Uh, but uh, if you uh, don't make like a bee for the door, uh, that's fine. Uh, um, I want to talk a little bit about project three before we uh, do that though. Uh, so uh, this, this is a variant of a slide you've seen before. You're going to need to make a database uh, a, a back end for your project. Uh, that database should have a new item, search and delete functionality. Uh, um, uh, yeah, optionally edit, but you don't have to have edit in there. Uh, but uh, yeah, create uh, yeah, search and delete, uh, absolutely. You're going to need to implement a chat bot for your site. Uh, this should be a chat bot that uh, adds some value to the website, should be intuitive to use, should have good enough coverage to uh, make it uh, at least pure interesting to the, to the website. Uh, it doesn't have to be a chat bot that you have uh, actually tested with people. Uh, so the way you would actually develop a chat bot uh, is you develop your minimal version, you'd uh, get a whole bunch of users in a user test, uh, see what they tried to say, uh, and uh, uh, you'd find how horrible the chat bot designer you are uh, and have to uh, add a million more things to your chat bot before it could actually hold any sort of conversation with one of your users. I don't expect you to do that for this project. Uh, as long as you can take a plausible first cut of here's what I would like to have my idealized dialogue with the chat bot look like, then we're probably okay in here. Uh, now I am going to bang on a little bit. I am going to see if I can uh, find ways of easily breaking it. So it should be uh, what you feel like is a robust chat bot, uh, but it doesn't have to be a usability tested chat bot with actual users. I'm really your only user aside from your project group uh, on, uh, on this one. Um, you'll need to host your projects on Bluemix. That's the one that uh, we're going to use the project time today to uh, work on uh, to get it uh, started hosted up there. Uh, and uh, you'll need your uh, working demo of your Project 2 hooked up to these back-end services to actually make it more real than it was during your Project 2 presentation. So those are the four things for uh, Project 3 in here. Uh, um, just to be clear on what the uh, grading uh, uh, components are on this, uh, um, 15 points total again on this. Uh, four points of these are for the presentation. Uh, 
really just is it a good demo? Does it walk through the motivation for the website properly? Does it walk through the functionality properly? Have you shown all the pieces you implemented? Uh, uh, is it something that if you were giving a, a pitch of this, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it would be a uh, compelling uh, pitch of it? Uh, I've always in the past set this up as uh, uh, you're pitching to uh, your uh, your investors. You want to have somebody give you a hundred thousand bucks to uh, actually develop this for real and go out and make a business out of it. Uh, and uh, uh, that's kind of just a, a a cheesy way of saying uh, try and make it a smooth delivery, try and make it a smooth presentation around this stuff, and make it a compelling uh, a, a pitch to uh, people. Uh, four points of the uh, grading on this is uh, database design and function. Do things actually work? Is it actually pulling things up out of the database? Is the database populated? Uh, uh, can I delete things? Can I uh, do what you're supposed to be able to do with the uh, database? A little bit less for the chat bots, three points there. Uh, and then four points of this is code quality and robustness. Uh, this is uh, one that I would like you to spend some time uh, thinking about working on. I'm including a, a little bit there uh, in terms of uh, uh, your proper commits, working as a group, uh, so I can see things checked into GitHub by all of you. Uh, um, if you want to uh, try and use some of the uh, project structure of having somebody uh, do pull requests and stuff, you're welcome to. You don't have to. Um, I won't take uh, marks off for not doing pull requests, but I do want to see your group members contributing and uh, commit messages at times that make sense. Um, if you want to, uh, as you're working on your project, uh, look at some of my uh, projects to uh, think about when commit messages should happen. Uh, uh, the simple test one today uh, is actually a uh, pretty good representation of that. Uh, and so uh, you'll notice that my commit messages when I was in here, uh, and this was a really simple example, uh, but I still made three commits. Uh, I had an initial commit moving code in, and uh, whenever you move uh, uh, anything in from outside, you want to commit that just as it is, uh, even before you start messing with it, uh, just because that's your reference that you can go back to if you start breaking things. Uh, and then I uh, did something. I added a .git ignore, and this is kind of a logical something. There's nothing else that I need to do but a git ignore. So I checked it in. Um, even though it wasn't a confusing step, it was a logical step to take. Uh, and then I added the root. Uh, now, I could have uh, made a commit for adding uh, the... Uh, uh, the app.js change and a commit for the index.js change and a commit for adding foo.html. Uh, and that wouldn't have been the worst thing in the world, uh, but all three of these file changes, all three of these operations uh, were conceptually part of the task of adding a root. And so there's no reason to break them down into individual commit messages. It just takes more time to uh, do your push uh, up there. Uh, and the point of the commit really is to uh, have the set of things that is a logical grouping be the basis of your commit message. And so try and make sure that uh, you're uh, doing commits on a regular basis, that uh, there are logical groupings, uh, that you have multiple people on your team doing those commits so it's clear that everybody is contributing to the, uh, the project. Uh, and um, in terms of the uh, code robustness uh, marks, uh, um, basically uh, just make sure you don't have silly bugs in there and you've done your comments in the way that it's readable by, and uh, that uh, uh, it all kind of looks uh, it, it looks reasonable. And if you have questions as you're coming up on things, ask me. Yeah, but uh, most of this are uh, showing that you're working together well as a group, that you're using GitHub properly yeah, and uh, committing properly on things. Questions about Project 3 or Project 3 grading? Okay. Nobody's asking questions. It means I'm talking too much. So I'm going to quit talking and uh, let you guys... Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead and uh, break out to uh, project uh, work. Oh, I ought to talk homework as well. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not going to quit talking yet. Obviously, I love talking. Um, two parts to this week's homework. Part number one is exactly what I am asking you to do here in the uh, uh, breakout work time again. Uh, um, uh, and again, I would love to see you all get this uh, get this done because uh, you're a big step on the way to having a successful project. You do it, but uh, if you do it at home, that's fine too. Um, can do it as project group. Uh, uh, take your Project 2 website, port it up to Bluemix. Uh, you're open to make changes, but you don't have to make changes. You don't have to tie it to any back end or change anything else. Uh, uh, make sure the GitHub project is based off the Node.js Cloud uh, starter we just used. Uh, so I would go ahead and uh, take the uh, starter pack when you, uh, uh, sign, or when you create your website like we did the other week. Uh, there was that zip file with the starter code that was in there. I would take that uh, and uh, uh, create a uh, GitHub project, put a readme in it, uh, uh, you bring that down to your uh, local machine, uh, unzip that uh, a starter pack from Bluemix into that directory you just created from your GitHub project, so you did your git clone, uh, and then you'll do a git status in there, see all the starter pack files in there, 
immediately do an add commit and a push to push that up to GitHub. And that's the, uh, the set of things that you use as your starting point. And then you'll from there take uh, the uh, uh, files that you created for project two, uh, your set of HTML files and CSS files and stuff. Uh, and you'll be again copying that into that uh, project directory that you just expanded your Bluemix starter files into. Uh, uh, maybe leaving them all in one directory or like uh, you ask a minute ago, go putting them in the styles directory. Uh, um, uh, whichever way is fine. Uh, just get them copied in there, right? And uh, then do another push up to GitHub so that it's all up there. Uh, and uh, then you'll go ahead uh, and start editing those files and making it look the way that you want it to, installing the installs and stuff that are in there. So make sure your uh, project three GitHub starts with the uh, Cloud and uh, uh, Starter uh, Pack from Bluemix uh, and then add your project files to that. And that's going to be a lot easier way to do it uh, than uh, using your current project two uh, and uh, adding the Bluemix stuff to uh, your, uh, your project two. Um, and then individually, uh, I would like you to get the uh, site, uh, and by the site, I mean the one that you created as your uh, Project 2 site, uh, running locally on your machine in the way that we talked about today. Yeah. So make sure that you can do an NPM start on your local machine uh, and have that serve it to localhost 3000 and have your machine be able to uh, get to view that site properly. And that should be pretty easy in this case because uh, uh, you don't even have to talk to a database to get your Project 2 to uh, serve. If you find that you have to uh, kill the database connections to Bluemix uh, and just have it serving uh, local stuff by rewriting app.js, you're welcome to do that. Uh, I would encourage you, though, to go ahead and get the database connection to work as part of that as well, just like I did in the uh, lecture today, uh, just because you're going to need to do that next week anyways to start talking to your database. Um, you're going to turn in uh, as a uh, group uh, the uh, site running on Bluemix with the link to it on Bluemix. Uh, when I go to that link, I should see basically exactly what you presented for Project 2. And uh, then you're going to uh, send me an email individually with a screenshot of your site running locally on your machine just to show that uh, you uh, got that running locally. Does that all make sense? Cool. Get on Slack early. Ask questions if you get stuck. Get most of it in here tonight if you want. I'm around for the next hour to help with uh, uh, project questions and stuff, and we should just treat it as a working session. Um, that is the uh, a, a, a very place to start. So that's got the database in there and everything. And, and uh, so it's still that console. Uh, and uh, uh, not only that, but on that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 
Uh, no, it should never go up and get it. It, it uh, should go, uh, go right into the root of the directory and sort of around. So, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, let's do it. So your Linux console, uh, uh, you're installed right now. You have some Cloud Foundry apps, uh, and uh, I would delete uh, I would delete everything and try uh, and try it all from scratch. I Uh, yes, although uh, it's supposed to be your project to uh, a template that uh, they're making. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's yeah. Just modifying. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's exactly the same process. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I, I, uh, you could. Um, if, if you do that, though, you end up in the same get a whole bunch of files so you can't really track, and something's going to go wrong. And it's going to be um, so, so I would actually suggest starting with the template project, and so that will straighten and adding your dog and follow back to it. Um, so maybe the next dog will be next. So should I say You should make it again. <laughs> and now expand your uh, zip file into that. So say PWD. And that tells you the directory that you're in. And now uh, go to the zip file and just download it. Copy all of that into that directory that you can have this. You search for blue and And now we so, so everything is all there now. And uh, that's just all that's going to be last year. I'm going to say Perfect. And now you can go back to the steps that uh, this guy had. Uh, so uh, you can uh, you walk on the blue next with the API. Uh, it should do your security with the add your next password. Uh, and then you have to push up and so And I'm going to go over the other room and what you have to do. Yeah, yeah. 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 All of your credentials are sitting in the DCAT portal. Click on that. that. That actually has the password that you can use. That's a new side to the one. Yeah, yeah. So GitHub is that getting more of that simply has a single file name uh, that is uh, DCAT portal. Oh, you put the file name. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So DCAT dash local like this. Okay. That's, that's all we need to do there. Now I usually put a second file as well. Because that's all I need. Mean. That's all I need. Mean. Um, and then you can go to the second file. So that's that's what my You get that from? Uh, uh, well, the next step. I saw a red. Because usually at the end, uh, it uh, gives a little summary uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it gets a page in the middle. Oh, that's fine. Why not? So it's taking time. You see how it's just going to be? Yeah. I look all the way in front of it. Yeah. 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 So you did the uh, blue mix app, which was the again, new app. Uh, yeah, I must look at your uh, eyes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to uh, destroy it in here. In here, I'm going to enter the next speaker. Uh, yeah, I did it. Okay. Yeah, I did it. I did it. Yeah. 
So let's look at your Bluemix console. Can you open a new browser web page onto the console that can see it. So Oh, you're at the same issue. Okay, great. That was friends over here. So, which is the new one? And it's stopped. Yeah. Um, if you click on it, so that's not that one. That one is definitely not. Yeah. But over on that side.
Yeah, let's just try it. True. I want to try making a new bike head because uh, this may be actually a uh, fluid system issue because uh, I haven't gotten that error before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am uh, going through and doing a uh, <laughs> yeah, doing this right now. Uh, both of you guys, Mitch and uh, Joe, watch to uh, yeah, what I'm doing to make sure that I'm not doing anything differently than you've just done. Um, I'm in US South, which you can't get to, but that's okay. Default and light, we're on those things. Um, version 1.2, boilerplate, yep. Now, I'm not going to download the command line interface because I've already done that. We proved that by uh, having the uh, CF uh, command line tools. I am going to download the starter code because I want new starter code to work from. Let's open that. I'm going to grab all these guys and uh, let me close that and get out of that directory. And uh, then uh, do a uh, I'm just going to paste those into uh, my untangling Bluemix Fubar two. those guys um, and then make sure they're there they're there and then I'm going to uh, so that was my CD into the new directory I'm not going to make any changes right now manifest I don't need to uh, do anything with I'm going to set up my API I'm going to log in. Give my super secret password, nobody should see. <laughs> and then I'm going to push the thing. See anything different there uh, from what you did? Yeah. You did what? Oh. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So it wouldn't have known what to push, and it would have broken. Okay. You did download, and you did copy it to the directory you were pushing from, and you did all your APIs. Yeah. Right. Well, I'll give that up. Yeah, it's a new one out of two bits, but uh, no, no, no. What's that? Yeah. This makes no sense. I don't like it. 
halfway believe you're refreshed. It works just fine for me. So I think that you're. Ah, good. Good, good, good. Now, what do we do with all that? Okay, so now you have uh, the uh, the file uh, set up. Uh, it's all uh, in a directory, uh, and uh, so we are working on well, not getting it running well. It's currently. So we have a function console that and uh, uh, yeah, sure. There, just get uh, running. So you now should be able to, uh, even without doing any get ignore stuff or any of that, uh, go into your terminal window again over here uh, and uh, say uh, npm install. Yes. Uh, no, go to space. When that is finally done cranking away, uh, so you can start. And uh, <laughs> here's the one that we're going to get out of the place. I need a minute. You want to make sure it's good. You have to uh, change it and get that get it in the morning. So, yeah, that's very good. So, uh, yeah, now for the uh, web browser, the local host, colon 3 So, here's the web browser. This one? Yeah, you create a new tab. And that's the local host. And it works. You are now running local. This is a good thing. So now you should uh, go ahead and uh, uh, create a Git repository uh, and, uh, and copy all these files into your Git repository and create a uh, Git ignore uh, online DCAP dash local that based on. So that it ignores your DCAP local based on file and push it through that. So first, we can take that. Is it saying running yet? Uh, it's still saying it's not running. Yeah. It says running. Oh, uh, now we just want to type it. Yeah. Uh, go back to the other guy. Yeah. Uh, so it's not Go to the directory for one of those people in your terminal. Um, no, that's correct. So, they don't hear what they're starting to do. That's exactly the same thing to go. Now that your API and So here's the uh, the actual uh, 
the actual issue here. Um, there is another command called git init, and git init creates a new GitHub uh, directory wherever you are. But I haven't actually shown you how to use that one. And so rather than show you a new git command, I would actually rather you uh, go up to the GitHub website, uh, create a new repository in a new directory, uh, do a git clone to bring that down, and copy all these files over to that new directory. Um, because that's using commands to start email. Okay. And then do the git. And then do the git. Uh, come on. Yeah, so uh, I would uh, in the uh, views for all of your Google pages and uh, you can style for the And if you did that, so you know, views of the all And then uh, if you have a show great count of JS, So I want to make this point and call it something else. And then the way you'll watch that is by uh, giving me uh, the packaging slash and then whatever else you call it you have. And then I said I'm going to call you the first place and you know that's kind of where that point Sorry, that was long time in that year. So you are at that no, point when you have a running
Yeah, that's right. Uh, so uh, this is what I want to do with uh, uh, so the uh, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, that was So you can install and uh, and so on. Yeah, so I think it's a good idea to do that. Uh, and Now our most simple thing you see is that we need to grab it. Uh, 
Yes, there is. This is all of your files going up to the end. So this is where you created the decap JSON or decap JSON, and you did the install of the insert and find your graph or almost